Okay, uh, the program that I've been using to illustrate the bones can be downloaded or um, actually used online by going to HTTPS anatomylearning.com. So if you want to use that, you can. It's got some great stuff for muscles and other body systems as well. So I just thought I would throw that out there for you guys. Let's close this. Uh, and let's take a look at the additional bones that we need to deal with. We finished off in the previous video with the hyoid bone. So now we're going to talk about the vertebral column. And there are a few things that you need to be aware of. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to identify specific vertebrae. I will ask you to identify certain regions. So cervical region, the thoracic region, lumbar, sacrum. And vertebrae in all of those have some common characteristics. They all have a body, a spinous process, a transverse process, and a vertebral foramen. And that's across all of them. The ones that are slightly different, uh, the cervical ones do have a transverse foramen, which is where the vertebral artery goes. But I'll show you those. There are only two vertebrae I specifically want you to be able to identify, and that's the atlas and the axis. So let's take a look here at these, and we'll first go to the vertebral column and just get an overview. And here we have the vertebral column. Now, the cervical vertebrae are these seven that are at the top. And so these, and they make up this first upper curve. The top one is actually the atlas here. And the one below that is the axis, which I will show you separately in just a moment. So you should be able to identify this area, this curve, as the cervical region. The, uh, that is everything from the base of the skull down to the first of the thoracic region. There are seven vertebrae here. Thoracic vertebrae curve in a different direction. And this, uh, there are 12 thoracic vertebrae. A thoracic vertebrae, by definition, has a rib attached to it. And then we have the lumbar vertebrae, and there are five of those. This happens to be the area of the spine where we have problems with herniated discs a lot, um, just because we don't lift properly. And the further down we go, the more weight that these vertebrae are having to handle. We also have the sacrum here, and the coccyx. And the sacrum is part of the pelvis, but it is um, still part of the axial skeleton. The rest of the pelvis is part of the appendicular. So let's take a look at general characteristics here. First off, when we start looking at the vertebrae, um, as I said, there are similarities to them all. So looking at cervical vertebrae, for instance, we have the, I'm going to go through here, we have the body, which is this portion here. We have the vertebral foramen here. We have the spinous process and the transverse processes. This is the transverse foramen and and that is where we have the uh, vertebral artery pass through. The spinous process, that's the part that sticks out on skinny people, and you can see them poking through. And right here, the vertebral uh, foramen, that is where your spinal cord passes through. Now, the I said, spinal or um, cervical vertebrae have a lot of similarities to thoracic vertebrae, except the thoracic are bigger, but we still have the body. We have the vertebral foramen. We have the transverse process. And we have the spinous process. So you should be able to identify those on any 
of the vertebrae. I go down here, lumbar vertebrae, same thing. We are talking about vertebral body. We're talking about a transverse process, a spinous process, and the vertebral foramen. So those structures, regardless of what, what vertebrae I happen to pull out uh, and show you, you should be able to identify those. Now, there are a couple of vertebrae that are very specific. Um, they are the axis and the atlas. <clears throat> so let's take a look at these two vertebrae. And they're only showing half of the axis here, or the atlas here. So I'm going to go to a different view. And let's take a look here. And if we scroll down, that's the atlas. It has a particularly large vertebral foramen. It doesn't have very much of a spinous process at all. And these are the transverse processes. Now, this particular uh, vertebral foramen is very large because the second cervical vertebrae is the axis. The axis has this little pin that sticks up called a dens, and that dens sits right in there. Now, if you've heard the story of Atlas, well, Atlas held the world on his shoulders, and that's what the Atlas does. It articulates directly with the base of the skull, and that allows us to do this kind of nod and a little side-to-side -side motion Whereas the axis, which again, here's the dens, spinous process, the axis fits into that little space, and that allows a rotational movement to occur turning side to side. So let's go back here, and we'll look at some other portions here. And I really don't care about the vertebral ligaments or anything like that. We've got the zones of the spinal column. So let's take a look now at the thoracic cavity. And the thoracic cavity consists of the sternum. We've got the thoracic vertebrae. And you'll notice that each of the thoracic vertebrae has a rib attached. Now, the ribs, we have seven of these that attach directly to a vertebrae and then go and attach to the sternum itself. The sternum is made up of three portions. We've got this upper portion called the manubrium. We've got the body and we've got the xiphoid process. I'll show you a different image of that in a little bit. But these <clears throat> ribs are called true ribs. True ribs attach to a vertebrae and to directly by their own cartilage to the sternum. Now you'll notice that these ribs, these three, their cartilage doesn't attach directly to the sternum. They attach to the cartilage of a rib above. And so these are called false ribs. And actually, these two ribs down here that don't attach at all to the sternum are also called for, uh, false ribs. So we have five false ribs and seven true ribs. Now, the thing about these two is that the more specific term for them is floating rib. So floating ribs are a subset of false ribs. So um, all floating ribs are false, but not all false ribs are floating, basically what we're looking at. And if we go <clears throat> to the sternum, there are a few structures there that you should be aware of. We have the manubrium. We have notches where the ribs actually attach. We have the body, and we have the xiphoid process. 
additional structures that we have. This is the jugular notch and the clavicular notches. So the jugular notch is right here, and it's a good landmark. If you're trying to do a tracheotomy on someone, you find the jugular notch. And then you can palpate additional structures in the neck. And the clavicular notch is where the clavicle, your collarbone, actually attaches, and that keeps the shoulder from swinging too far forward. So we've got these, and let's go back here. We don't really require that you know a whole lot about the ribs other than true ribs versus false ribs versus floating ribs. So now let's go back and we're going to go to the sacrum. And the sacrum attaches to the ilium, which is this portion of this big bone called the coxal bone. And it's a combination of the sacrum and those coxal bones that end up making the pelvis. Better place to look at that is probably going to be in the virtual lab. Again, we go back here. The miscellaneous bones of the virtual uh, on the virtual lab, we have a few of the sternum again, and we have the sacrum. And if we take a look at these, there are some portions that you'll want to know. There is a superior sacral canal. We have the body of the sacrum. These openings to the sides are the sacral foramina, where we end up having nerves exit, and we have the sacral hiatus. So from a posterior view, what we're seeing of the sacrum is right here. And that is the sacrum. Again, the superior sacral canal, the sacral hiatus, and the sacral, sacral foramina. This is the iliac bone. And so this whoop, area right here is your sacroiliac joint. And that does give some people some problems. This actually does offer a lot of flexibility because it's not bone to bone so much as we've got uh, some dense regular connective tissue located in there. And, uh, that gives just a little bit of flexibility, which actually gives a, which gives the pelvis uh, an ability to absorb the shock of stepping. And that's really all we've got with those. We go back here again, and the last portion that we want to look at is the coccyx. And that's this little portion right here. It's three or four bones that are fused together, and it's the remnants of what was a tail, a vestigial tail. We walk upright. Um, we really don't need a tail to help us balance. Uh, it doesn't help us with movement. So over time, you know, it's kind of degenerated down to this. Now, some people are born with extremely long coccygeal bones, and they actually have a tail. Uh, generally speaking, that is removed now uh, at childbirth, and I think that's everything we need to discuss about the axial skeleton. So, we're going to stop right here.